This story actually happened to me, and I still can't shake the feeling that it's not over yet. My nights are a marathon of waking hours now, listening for that unmistakable sound. It started about three weeks ago. I live alone in a modest one-story house at the edge of a sleepy suburban neighborhood. My routine's always been the same home from work by 6 p.m. dinner, maybe some TV in bed by 11 p.m. But then those knocks began. We're always at 3.03 a.m. every single night. The first time it happened, I thought it was a prank. I checked the live feed on my ring camera and saw a hooded figure just standing there, face shrouded in an unnatural darkness that seemed to swallow the porch light's glow. I approached the door hesitantly, peered through the peephole, but saw nothing, no one was there. Chalking it up to some camera glitch, I tried to forget about it. But then it happened again the next night, and the night after that. Each time, the knock sounded louder, more urgent. After a week, I couldn't take it anymore. I showed the footage to the local police. They were skeptical but agreed to look into it. They took a copy of the video, but when they played it back at the station, the figure wasn't there just footage of an empty porch. They suggested it might be a technical issue, maybe someone messing with my system remotely. They advised me to get the camera checked and left it at that. I called a technician the next day, who inspected the camera and found nothing wrong. The device was functioning perfectly, he told me, and there were no signs of tampering. That night, bracing myself, I stayed up, watching the live feed on my laptop as 3.03 a.m. approached. Like clockwork, the figure appeared, knocked thrice, and then stood still, its head tilted as if listening for movement inside. I decided to confront it. Heart pounding, I opened the door just seconds after the knock, but again, there was nothing. The street was silent, bathed in the orange hue of the street lamps. I stepped out, searching the shadows, but found no trace of anyone. Returning inside, I replayed the video, and there it was the figure had been there, even as I looked right through where it should have stood. Night after night, I tried different methods setting up additional cameras, laying down salt and chalk lines, even a makeshift barrier of furniture. Nothing deterred the figure it always appeared at 3.03 a.m. knocked, and then faded away as mysteriously as it arrived. Desperation led me to research local legends and old town records, hoping for an explanation. What I found chilled me to the bone a century ago. The house that previously stood on my property was home to a reclusive figure known by locals as the Midnight Caller, a man rumored to have been part of a cult that practiced dark rituals. According to an old police report, the man had vanished without a trace one night leaving behind a house filled with strange symbols and a heavy, bolted door that led to a cellar no one ever managed to open. The house burned down under mysterious circumstances shortly after his disappearance, and a new one mine was built years later. Now, each night as 3.03 a.m. rolls around, I can't help but feel that whatever this midnight knocker wants, it's not done with me yet. Each knock seems to echo deeper into my soul, a grim reminder of something unresolved, something sinister waiting just beyond the veil of darkness. And every night, as I watch the figure appear and disappear, I wonder if tonight's the night it finally comes in. It was late April 2024 when things started going off kilter in my life. Living in a small, aging two-story house in Vermont that had been in my family for generations, I had settled into the peaceful monotony of rural life. 
My nearest neighbor was a good mile away, and it was typical for days to pass without seeing another soul. This isolation suited me just fine until my doorbell camera began sending alerts every night around 2.15 a.m. Each alert indicated movement by the front door, but every time I checked the live feed, I saw nothing but the swaying branches of the old oak that lined the driveway. Curious and a little unnerved, I started reviewing the footage during the day, looking for anything that might explain the alerts. That's when I noticed in my face, or what should have been my face, appearing in the lower corner of the living room window. It was me, unmistakably me, but paler, almost ghostly. I was upstairs, asleep in my bed each time this happened, yet there I was, staring out into the night with an expression twisted in distress. The first few times I saw it, I convinced myself it was some trick of the light, a reflection that just bizarrely resembled me. But as the nights wore on, the face grew more distinct, more desperate. It wasn't just looking out, it was looking for something, or perhaps looking at something. One night, driven by a mix of fear and determination, I decided to stay up. I positioned myself in the living room, the very room from where my own distressed visage had been observed. The clock ticked excruciatingly towards 2.15 a.m. I waited in the dark, the only light coming from the faint glow of the moon filtering through the curtains. As the time arrived, my phone vibrated an alert from the camera. Heart pounding, I picked it up, expecting or perhaps not wanting to see the usual scene. But there was again my face peering out. Only this time I was looking directly at myself sitting there in the living room. The phone nearly slipped from my hand. I snapped my gaze up to the window but saw only my reflection in the glass. The next day I was a mess of nerves. I pulled out old family albums, searching for any clue or explanation, any family history of twins or doppelgangers that might explain my nightly visitor. Yet, each night, my own face continued to appear, each time more wretched than the last. Desperate for answers, I contacted a local historian familiar with the region's lore. Over coffee, he shared tales of the supernatural that had long been part of the area's history, including a story about a mirror walker, a spirit that manifests as your reflection, revealing itself in moments of immense personal turmoil or distress. The historian's words struck a chord. I had been avoiding the truth of my own life, my own unhappiness and isolation, which seemed to mirror the increasingly tormented expressions of my nocturnal twin. That night, I didn't just watch, I approached the window, reached out to the glass, and for the first time spoke to it to me. I see you, I whispered. What do you want? The face, my face, pressed closer, its lips moving in silent urgency. Since then, the alerts have stopped. No more faces in the window. But the encounter left me with an eerie clarity, perhaps what we see in reflections, in the corners of our eyes or the periphery of our lives, are not haunts but manifestations of our own fears and sorrows, beckoning us to face them, to confront ourselves. And maybe, just maybe, that's the most terrifying thing of all. I remember it was a rainy season, not that the specific month matters. It seemed to rain endlessly sheets of water draping the landscape, turning days into dusk and nights into a deeper shade of black. I live alone in a house that skirts the boundary of a sprawling forest, a setting that might be considered idyllic by some but tends towards the eerie when you're as isolated as I am. The nearest town is a good 15-minute drive, so when something unusual happens, it feels all the more sinister. 
It started one evening when my outdoor security camera, triggered by movement, sent an alert to my phone. Expecting maybe a raccoon or at worst a stray dog, I checked the feed. There on the screen was a small child standing at the edge of my driveway, draped in a yellow raincoat, staring into the camera with an intensity that sent chills down my spine. The rain had plastered the coat to the child's small frame, and even through the grainy nighttime footage, I could see water dripping from the hem. I rushed to the front door, flipping on the porch light and pulling it open, but there was nothing there just the sound of rain hitting the gravel, no sign of footprints or any other indication that someone had been standing just a few meters away. Thinking it might be a lost child, I grabbed an umbrella and searched around the property, calling out into the night, but my voice was swallowed by the forest and the downpour. This mysterious visitation happened repeatedly over the next several nights. Each time the camera would alert me, and each time I'd find the child in the same spot, unmoving, just staring. Each time I'd rush to investigate, and each time the child would vanish without a trace. I tried adjusting the camera's settings, thinking maybe it was some glitch or a trick of the light, but the appearances continued. The alert came as usual, but this time the child wasn't at the edge of the driveway. The child was right at my doorstep, looking directly up into the doorbell camera my heart froze as I watched the live feed on my phone. The child's face was obscured by the hood of the raincoat, but I could see little hands pressed against the glass of the door. I approached the door slowly phone in hand, watching both the screen and the real world in front of me. I reached for the handle, took a breath, and pulled it open. Nothing. No child, no yellow coat, just the cold, wet air and the relentless rain. I stepped out, scanning the area, but it was like the child had melted away with the rain. That's when I noticed it on the inside of the glass, a small, wet handprint, perfectly clear against the foggy pane. It was inside, not outside where the child should have been. The realization that whatever had been visiting hadn't just been looking in, but had somehow been inside my house all along was enough to make me recoil in horror. I reported it to the police the following day, but their search turned up nothing. No missing children were reported, no signs of any child living or moving through the area. They suggested it might be some kids pranking, although how they would manage such a feat was beyond explanation. I installed more cameras, added locks, but the child never appeared again. The only evidence that remained of those eerie nights was the small handprint, which I found myself unwilling to clean. It's a stark reminder of the permeable boundary between the known and the unknown, a mystery with no resolution that has left me questioning the reality of what I saw. Could a child have been lost, only to find shelter unseen in my home? Or was it something else, something drawn to the loneliness of a solitary house in the rain? Whatever it was, it left an indelible mark not just on the glass, but on me. I still catch myself checking the cameras, waiting for a yellow raincoat that never comes, listening to the rain and wondering about the things we see when the rest of the world is asleep. The bizarre incidents began in early March this year when I moved into my small house on the outskirts of a coastal town the place came with a sophisticated security system, something the previous owner, a tech enthusiast, took pride in. For the first few weeks, everything was normal, and I settled into my new life without incident. One evening, while reviewing the camera footage, I noticed a peculiar glitch. 
The timestamp on the recordings was exactly one year prior to the current date. At first, I thought it was a simple error in the system settings, but when I tried to reset the date and time, the glitch persisted. The footage from a year ago was mundane, mostly just the empty porch and quiet street. But then, something chilling appeared on screen. A man I had never seen before walked up to the front door. He was just an ordinary guy, maybe in his early 40s, but as he approached, his demeanor shifted. He stopped abruptly, his eyes widened in terror, and he screamed, staring at something off camera that I couldn't see. Then he turned and ran, disappearing from the frame. This footage was unsettling enough, but I rationalized it as some forgotten drama of the previous owner. Maybe a practical joke or a rehearsed scene, I told myself. However, the thought of what could have terrified him so thoroughly nagged at me. I showed the footage to a neighbor, hoping for some insight, but they were as clueless as I was. I almost forgot about the incident as life carried on. But exactly one year to the day of that eerie footage, my camera alerted me to movement at the front door. Expecting a delivery or maybe a solicitor, I checked the live feed. There he was the same man from the year old footage, only now he looked older, more haggard. His eyes were wild with fear as he pounded on my door, shouting for me to let him in. Rushing to the door, I flung it open, and he nearly fell inside, gasping for breath. His story poured out in frantic, broken sentences. He had been the previous tenant of the house, and exactly one year ago, he explained, he had seen a horrifying apparition on my porch, a grotesque, shadowy figure with eyes that seemed to burn right through him. It had terrified him to his core, causing him to flee the house and never return until now. He had come back, driven by a mix of unresolved fear and a desperate need to warn me on the anniversary of his terrifying encounter. As he spoke, a cold dread settled over me. The security system, he speculated, it might have recorded the event due to a set loop or backup that preserved footage from exactly one year prior but why it showed only that particular day and none other was a mystery neither of us could explain. We decided to wait together as the hour approached when he had seen the apparition a year earlier. We watched the porch through the window and the live feed on my laptop. The street was silent, save for the occasional distant sound of the ocean. Then, just as the clock ticked over to the exact minute when he had screamed a year ago, the air around us grew inexplicably cold. The camera feed flickered, and there, in the static and noise, the same shadowy figure began to materialize on the screen. The man beside me went pale, his worst memories confirmed. Without hesitation, we left the house the need for answers overridden by our survival instincts. We spent the night at a nearby hotel, discussing what to do next. By morning, we had decided to contact paranormal investigators, hoping they might explain or even clear the haunting. Returning to the house with the team was nerve-wracking. They set up their equipment, capturing temperature fluctuations and electromagnetic disturbances but the shadowy figure did not appear again. Their final report suggested a possible haunting, though they couldn't determine the nature or intent of the apparition. Since then, I've moved out, unable to feel safe or at peace in that house. The footage, both old and new, remains on a hard drive, a digital testament to the unexplained and unseen horrors that drove us from our home. The experience has left me cautious and wary, forever aware that some things in this world defy explanation and that sometimes ignorance truly is bliss.
It was a typical Thursday morning, and I'd just stumbled out of bed, the taste of last night's takeout still lingering. I was pouring my coffee when my phone pinged with a notification from the doorbell camera. Movement detected at the front door. Normally I'd ignore it, thinking it was just a stray cat or another door-to-door -door salesman. But something, maybe a leftover dream, nudged me to check. On the screen, I saw the front porch, a view tinged with the soft gray of early morning. But there, picking up the newspaper, was someone who looked exactly like me. He wore the same ruffled pajamas I had on, his hair a messy mirror image of mine. The scene would have been comical, except he did everything in reverse, like a video played backwards. He walked to the door, picked up the paper, then noticed the camera. His smile wasn't friendly, it was chilling, knowing. Then he walked backwards, his steps unnaturally smooth, until he blurred and vanished as if he'd never been there. I stood frozen, coffee forgotten, as I replayed the video. It was real. I wasn't dreaming. My mind raced with impossible questions. Was it a twin brother I never knew about? Or some bizarre prank with deep fake technology? My thoughts were cut off by another ping. Another movement alert. This time I watched live. Nothing. Just the empty porch in the quiet street. I decided to work from home, unsettled by the morning's event. Throughout the day, I glanced at the door, half expecting to see the other me again, but he never appeared. That night, though, things took another turn. I was washing dishes when I felt it a piercing stare. I looked up, straight out the window above the sink, and there he was again, standing just beyond the glass, mimicking my movements with that same reverse fluidity. Our eyes met, and he smiled that eerie smile again. This time I ran to the door flung it open, ready to confront whatever this was. But he had faded into the dark, leaving no trace but a cold gust of wind that smelled faintly of my own cologne. Sleep was elusive that night. Every shadow seemed to move, every sound a footstep of the other me returning. But nothing happened. At least not until morning. The next few days were a series of unnerving glitches. My phone would show texts I never sent, selfies of us together I never took. Items around the house moved just slightly from where I left them, always in a pattern that suggested the reverse of my usual habits. I felt like I was losing my mind. Was this other me trying to replace me or simply haunt me? Determined for answers, I set up additional cameras around the house, inside and out. I needed to catch him, understand what was happening. The breakthrough came on a stormy Tuesday night. The cameras inside flickered as if with static and then he was there, in my house, not just on the porch or in the yard. He roamed the rooms, touching my things, sitting in my chairs, all while I watched from my bedroom, locked in and too terrified to confront him. He knew I was there, could feel my fear. He paused at my bedroom door, his hand on the knob, and smiled directly into the camera. Then he spoke, and it was my voice, but not. You know he said his words as clear as the rain outside. We could be friends his laughter. A dark echo of my own filled the house as the power cut out. When the lights returned, he was gone, and so was the sense of invasion. I checked the footage, but everything from that night had been erased, as though he'd never breached the inside of my house. I couldn't shake the feeling that he was still there, somewhere close, watching and waiting. 
The cameras never caught him again, but sometimes late at night I hear laughter echoing through the halls, a haunting reminder that he could return any moment to claim the life that mirrors his own. Every night, I rely on the low hum of the city to lull me to sleep. Living alone has its perks, but the silence isn't one of them. That's why I installed a doorbell camera that records audio it gives me a sense of security, knowing I can see and hear anything at my front gate. It was around 2 a.m. on a windy Tuesday when my phone buzzed with a notification from the camera. Groggy and annoyed, I checked the live feed, expecting to see a raccoon or a late-night Uber driver at the wrong address. Instead, there was a woman standing by my gate. She was pale, almost ghostly in the dim street light, her hair disheveled and clothes damp as if she'd been caught in a rainstorm that hadn't happened. Her eyes were wide with what looked like fear, and her mouth was open in an exaggerated scream but it was completely silent, no sound from her at all. I watched, puzzled and starting to freak out, as she stood there, screaming silently. I thought maybe the audio was broken, but I could hear the wind and the distant sound of a car alarm perfectly. Just nothing from her. After about a minute, she stopped, closed her mouth, and walked away, disappearing into the night as suddenly as she had appeared. I tried to go back to sleep, telling myself it was just someone with mental health issues, or maybe a prank, but sleep wouldn't come. By morning, I had convinced myself to review the footage, to make sure I hadn't dreamed the whole disturbing scene. When I played the recording back, I braced myself to see her again, but nothing prepared me for what happened. As soon as her image appeared on screen, a scream erupted from my phone speaker. It was loud, piercing, and so full of terror and pain that it felt like it cut right through me. The scream in the playback was nothing like the silent agony I witnessed. It was deafening, chilling to the point where I dropped my phone and covered my ears. I replayed it several times. Each time the scream was there, loud and terrifying. It made no sense. How could a silent scream in the night play back so loudly? I sent the clip to a friend who's into tech, thinking maybe it was a glitch, or I was losing my mind. He was as baffled as I was and suggested I contact the police, in case the woman was in danger or needed help. I hesitated, unsure of involving the police in what might just be a bizarre anomaly, but I couldn't shake the image of her face, the sound of that scream. Eventually, I went to the local station, showed them the footage, and explained everything. They took it seriously but found nothing, no reports of missing women matching her description, no other incidents like it in the area, nothing. Nights became restless after that. I'd jump at every notification from the camera, half expecting to see her again, to hear that scream, but she never came back. I started researching, looking into the history of my house, the neighborhood, anything that might explain what happened. It turned out that decades ago, before my quiet street was built up into the sleepy suburban spot it is now, it had been the site of a tragic accident. A woman had been hit by a car and killed late one night in a hit and run. Witnesses at the time reported that they heard her screams from blocks away. Could it be her? haunting the place where she died. I don't really believe in ghosts, but I also can't explain what happened. The camera hasn't recorded anything like that since, but sometimes when the wind blows just right, I think I can hear a faint screaming, mingling with the city's hum, reminding me of the night the silent screamer visited my gate. Living on the edge of town has its perks, like the silence of the evenings and the clear, unobstructed view of the stars. My house, a modest one with a spacious backyard, borders a dense woodland, making it the perfect escape from the city's relentless pace. 
To keep an eye on my surroundings, I installed security cameras around the property. They were mostly for peace of mind until that night in early September, just past midnight, when my phone lit up with a motion alert from one of the backyard cameras. Expecting maybe a raccoon or a stray dog, I pulled up the footage. What I saw instead sent a chill through me. There was a figure in a tattered wedding gown wandering aimlessly across my lawn. The dress was dirty, layers of lace torn, trailing behind her like ghostly tendrils. Her face was obscured by a thick, laced veil that fluttered slightly with each slow, deliberate step she took. The sight was unsettling, to say the least, but the logical part of my brain suggested she was just a lost party-goer from some late-night wedding, perhaps a bit too intoxicated. However, as I watched, she didn't seem to notice or care about her surroundings. She just wandered aimlessly and endlessly until she finally drifted back toward the woods. I saved the footage thinking it might be useful in case she came back or someone reported her missing. Night after night, she returned. Each visit drew her closer to my house, until one evening I found something on my porch that hadn't been there the day before an old, faded wedding invitation. The paper was yellowed and brittle, the elegant script barely legible. But I could make out the date it was for that very night, September 5th. The same date as when I first saw her. Each subsequent night she left another invitation, always dated for September 5th, every year. This ritual unnerved me, so I began researching the history of my home and the surrounding lands. I discovered a tragic story from decades earlier about a young bride who had lived in my house. She had been jilted at the altar, left waiting in her wedding dress as her fiancé never showed. Devastated, she wandered into the woods later that night and was never seen again. Her story was a local legend I had somehow missed, dismissed as spooky lore meant to entertain teenagers and ghost hunters. But now, faced with these nightly visits and eerie invitations, the legend felt all too real. Her face, always hidden beneath that thick veil, seemed a deliberate attempt to obscure her identity or perhaps to shield me from the sorrow that such a sight would surely hold. I stopped removing the invitations, letting them pile up on the porch, each one a silent testament to her return. As the nights grew colder, her appearances became more desperate, her movements more agitated. One night, compelled by a mix of fear and sympathy, I decided to confront her. I stepped onto the porch as she approached, her figure illuminated by the soft porch light. Can I help you, I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She stopped, her head tilting slightly, as if confused by my presence or my offer of help. She didn't respond, nor did she move any closer. We stood there, merely feet apart, separated by the screen door, the silence between us filled only by the rustle of the trees. Finally, she turned, walking back toward the woods, her figure disappearing into the night. I haven't seen her since that night. The invitation stopped appearing and the backyard remained still, the camera alerts silent. Sometimes I wonder if she found what she was looking for, or if she simply gave up, her story destined to remain unresolved. The solitude of my home feels different now. It's quieter, somehow emptier. I keep the old invitations in a drawer, a reminder of the uninvited guest who visited, not to frighten, but perhaps to remember and be remembered.